Welcome to the Creepin' It Real Show, your one-stop shop for weird news, spooky, otherworldly, and paranormal shenanigans. We'll take a dive into what's going on in creepy pop culture. You can follow us on Twitter at creepin underscore it and like us on Facebook at The Creepin' It Real Show. Do you have a paranormal story you'd like to share with us? You can email us at creepinitrealshow at gmail.com. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hit record. Yes. I did. And I recorded right now. And <laughs> happy Halloween to all of you creepers, you freak, nasty, crazy assholes. Um, it's just me and our today, people. so... Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you never know what's going to happen today because we don't have anybody steering the ship. So uh, it's just me and Moni, and we can get off on some interesting tangents. And we can so. get off, period. End of sentence. Now, well, <laughs> hell yeah. Um, speaking of, how are you this morning, dear Moni? I'm good. I'm having my first relaxing day in, in quite a few days, but um, I am on my second cup of coffee, and I have a nice Florida story in honor of all the Florida things that are happening as of late, so I'm ready for weird news, too. Sweet. Well, I got up this morning, and I, I'm telling you, everybody always says, like, they're afraid of 40, but I am, like, living my best life right now. I got up. I washed my face with my little wand doohickey. I did a microdermabrasion treatment with some, like, oils afterwards, and I brewed myself a latte. I was oh like, damn. I need to be 40 just everybody... so my kids to be old enough that I can have time <laughs> for stuff like that. No shade thrown at you, man. That is best Exactly. <laughs> no, it totally is. Like, I, my kids are on their own now. I mean, they're not on their own, but they do their own fucking thing they're still on bed it's noon i mean i love oh. this time um uh, madeline's about to start driving herself i got a kid who oh, walks to the grocery store for me because he loves it and um i'm like man this is what it's about oh so. i went out to breakfast with my two maniacs and besides the fact that i can't even do justice to how absurd my two-year-old is but i see these two slightly just two three more three more years older than my kids go sit down with their grandparents and were just excited sweet nice young ladies and i was like am i ever gonna get there are we gonna die in this phase like i just feel like i'm in the desert mm -hmm. and that's like the mirage that's ahead of me that may not be real <laughs> It does happen. Um, I'll tell you that, you know, one of ours is still a shit from time to time. And then we've got the other one that's the teenager who, good God, I mean, like the horrors of having a sophomore girl with a boyfriend, you oh. know, is a nightmare in itself. So the stress continues, but it be changes. They're who they are, but my husband actually had to take yeah. them both out of the re bodily out of the restaurant so that I could finish paying, uh -huh. finish eating because it was so bad. <laughs> Like, I'm yep. anywhere we can just sit in the same place at the same time, you know? Yeah. That'd be great. Yep. It'll, it'll happen. It'll happen soon. The two-year-old can then open you're her be... bedroom door now, which is like my worst nightmare because uh -oh. we just took her out of her crib and we're like, at least you can stay in her room and play where it's safe. And this morning I'm like, she's like, I want to go out the door. And I said, no, I got to change your diaper. And she just looks back, opens the door, gives me a little naughty smile with one little dimple on the side of her face and took off out the door. <laughs> it's like, shit, <laughs> this is happening now. Yeah, you're screwed. Pretty much. Um, but in the meantime, can I talk about Florida? Because um, you know, the not funny part, obviously, this pipe bomber that was caught yesterday had sent, I, I want to say it was 14 pipe bombs. Of course, a MAGA supporter. We won't even get into that. But to make it, and it was Florida. And we just, I just mentioned last week, I think, the FARC, um, FARC.com website that has a tag mm -hmm. just for Florida. So they have yeah. a story on this bomber, and as funny as he is not, uh, male bomb suspect Caesar Sayok was a big muscle head stripper, says former boss. Yeah, <laughs> so. you, you see, I saw those pictures yesterday, and I was like, <laughs> ew, not enough eye bleach in the world for that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, just in the gift that keeps on giving as far as Florida goes, uh, sending a, a dozen mail bombs, blah, 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 blah. Worked as a mail stripper um, in the 1990s, which he's 56 now. He wouldn't have been that young. This isn't like a late teens, early 20-something guy doing it. Oh, pictures where it didn't happen. I don't have the pictures mm -mm, here. That makes me mm -mm. sad. He really you can't find his niche in life, and I guess he found it now. Well, he can be stripping in prison for some for some bigger guys. Back in the 90s, he was running around from Minnesota to the Carolinas to Florida. He was like a gypsy. You're telling me someone that has behaved and come to do what he's done didn't fit in in the world and was a little odd? 
Um, mm-hmm. He, his former stripper boss, had actually vouched for him in a 2014 theft case. Said he was a big muscle head who wanted to be a professional wrestler. That was his dream. He never discussed politics and wasn't known to abuse drugs. Maybe he needed to take some drugs to even his shit out before what he did. I would hire to send him. I would hire him to send him to do these shows. He would just go do a strip show and leave. He was a stripper. He was dancing for a guy out in Oklahoma too. Oh, dancing for a guy, huh? That's uh, because he he said he would not employ him again because he got old. He's like 900 years now old now. I wouldn't hire a 50 or 60 year old stripper. Well, at least I know that it uh-uh. happens to men too, where they age out of being worthwhile in certain industries. Uh, it's usually just the women we turn 30, and then it's like, no. Uh, the All Girl exactly. Club did not immediately respond to requests for comment. Okay, but can we go? Oh, it's called Chip and Fellas. Christy, when I come south, let's go to Florida <laughs> and go to Chip and Fellas. Oh, <laughs> hell no. You couldn't pay me enough to go see what's going on down there. It's an experience, yo. Uh, no, where we're going to go when you come down here is we're going to the Claremont Lounge, which is where it's called Where Strippers Go to Die, and it's old ladies stripping, and it's the best funnest club bar ever it is actually a ball it's so fun so i have to take everybody who comes to visit me there it's howard stern's favorite place to go huh i can it's kind of see that maybe oh it's awesome you're gonna love it okay well that that's my story although while you do yours i am going to um google some images because i apparently am tempting with the eye bleach right now but Let's talk oh, about the Lord. novelist okay, who penned How to Murder Your Husband charged with husband's murder. Yes. So, um, how do you get away with murder? Maybe don't write a blog post <laughs> about it. Uh, last week, which this was an old, a somewhat old article, I just thought it was hysterical. Um, and since we're talking a lot about murders today, uh, why not? 68-year-old Nancy Crampton Bro- Brophy, Brophy, sorry, was arrested. <laughs> She's charged with the murder and the death of her 63-year-old husband, Chef Daniel Brophy. At 8.30 a.m. on June 2nd, police and medics arrived at the Oregon Culinary Institute after students and instructors arriving for class found Brophy suffering from a gunshot wound. The first responders attempted to revive him but weren't successful. In a press conference that day, police said they were investigating the death as a homicide and that they had no immediate suspects. Crampton Brophy is a self-published author of romantic suspense novels, many featuring chiseled ex-Navy seals, booked <laughs> books with rugged men, strong women, and a good story. Ah. There she described her home life, part of which read like the satisfying, satisfying pages of a romance novel. I live in the beautiful green and very wet northwest, married to a chef whose mantra is life is science project. As a result, there are chickens and turkeys in my backyard, a fabulous vegetable garden, which grows tobacco, pack, tobacco for an insecticide and hot meal on table every night, blah, 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 blah. I can't tell you when I fell in love with my husband, but I relate the moment I decided to marry him. I was in the bath. It was the big tub. I expected him to join me, and he would, when he was delayed, I called out, Are you coming? Oh. His answer convinced me he was Mr. Right. Yes, but I'm making whores divorce. <laughs> I always say that order. <laughs> Can you imagine spending... I also call champagne champagne, Chihani. just for the yeah. fun of it. Yeah. Can you imagine spending the rest of your life without a man like that? But in 2011, for a blog called See Jane Publish, Crampton Brody wrote an essay titled How to Murder Your Husband. <laughs> As a romantic suspense writer, I spend a lot of time thinking about murder and consequently about police procedure. After all, if the murder is supposed to set me free, I certainly don't want to spend any time oh. in jail. And let me say, clearly for the record, I don't like jumpsuits and orange isn't my color. Well, guess what, bitch? <laughs> your poor hors d'oeuvres making husband is now dead, so guess what you get to spend your time in. So I'm just reading through this because I don't want to read the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so they've been married for 27 years, uh, reportedly the or and according to the Oregonian and were totally inseparable, Brody, yeah. inseparable Brody was the lead instructor at the Culinary Institute, um, blah, blah, blah. The day after husband's death, Crampton Brody posted an update on Facebook. I have sad news to relate. My husband and best friend, Chef De- Brophy was killed yesterday morning, blah, blah, blah. She's really sad and overwhelmed. Please save phone calls before a few days until I can function. But a neighbor, Don McConnell, told the Oregonian of an odd interaction with the widow. 
she never showed any signs of, of being upset or sad. I would say she had an air of relief, mm-hmm. like it was almost a godsend. He asked whether the police had been keeping her updated. She said, no, I'm a suspect. <laughs> the news was a jolt to others. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, and near the end of the blog post, imaging of how and why to kill one's husband, Crampton wrote that she finds it is easier to wish people dead than to actually kill them. <clears throat> I don't want to worry about blood and brains splattered on my walls, and really, I'm not good at remembering lies. But the thing I know about murder is that every one of us have it in him, her, Gee. when pushed far enough. Wow. Ooh. Ha, it says, Crampton Brophy was arraigned in Multanoc, whatever, County Circuit Court. On Thursday, the judge approved a request by prosecutors to seal, seal the court document outlining the case against her. She wore a blue jumpsuit. Oh, ah, well then, good for her. <laughs> At least she didn't have to wear the orange. So, yeah. What a bitch. I mean, and you know, the, you know the blog post was just also, we know people like that who just want to get attention. Not only did she oh, get totally. to get rid of someone that apparently she was sick of for whatever reason, she also posted that so that people would have they're outpouring and she was saying no phone calls yeah because she couldn't get enough emotion into her voice to say you know i'm so sad that this happened yeah whatever yep so uh before we get into our main event which is top 10 most horrific crimes committed on halloween um i wanted us to talk about a couple of other things I really like, I'm, you know, as a Scottish and Irish person, Mm -hmm. uh, we also recognize Samhain, which it's spelled like Sam Hain. It don't say that around anybody (laughs) who's Celtic because we will absolutely fall on our face. (laughs) So um, I I wanted to wish all my Celtic brothers and sisters a happy Samhain. Um, For those of who don't know what that is, it's a celebration of death and is celebrated from October 31st to November 1st to welcome in the harvest and usher in the dark half of the year. It's basically saying goodbye to life, which they always attributed summer as like life because plant growth and that was literally how they lived. So it's kind of important back then. Um, Celebrants believe that the barriers between the physical world and the spirit world break down during Samhain, allowing more interaction between humans and denizens of the other world early texts present Samhain as a mandatory celebration lasting three days and three nights where the community was required to show themselves to local kings or chieftains failure to participate was believed to result in punishment from the gods usually illness or death some documents mention six days of drinking alcohol to excess typically mead or beer along with glutinous face i mean hello am i not scottish or what (laughs) Um, because the Celts believed that the barrier between worlds was breachable during Samhain, they prepared offerings that were left outside villages and fields for fairies, and it was expected that ancestors might cross over during this time as well, and Celts would dress as animals and monsters so that fairies were not tempted to kidnap them. So that's Samhain, so happy Samhain to all my freaks, and I I figured since you are of Hispanic descent, which I grew up in half my, my dad is Scottish and my stepmother is Hispanic, so you can just imagine the partying I go through (laughs) um, when I go visit, and when you've got Samhain on one day and Dele das Muertos on the other day, it gets crunk around this time of the year. So I figured you would want to talk about the Dia de los Muertos. Yeah, I'm also laughing about the fairy thing because I personally yeah. don't believe that. But um, I think it was Bizarre States I was listening to. They were talking about how when things go missing, that it could be like a poltergeist yeah. or something from the spirit world or somebody trying to fuck with you. And the other day, and I was like, I, and I was telling somebody this, and I was like, I don't believe in fairies, but man, I get a lot of stuff that moves around. And it was in my office, which we know is haunted, and I couldn't find a flash drive. I dug through my purse for 30 minutes. Everyone saw me digging. And then later when I didn't need it anymore, I went back to my purse, and it was right on top. And I was like, God damn fairies, stop messing with me. <laughs> so there you go. It was, it's fairies, man. It's not what you think. That's funny. <laughs> yep. Happy. I, agree. I believe. Yeah, it must be. Happy Dia de los Muertos, or Day of the Dead, is a holiday celebrated on November 1st. Although marked throughout Latin America, Dia de los Muertos is most strongly associated with Mexico, where the tradition originated. Dia de los Muertos honors the dead with festivals and lively celebrations, a typically Latin American custom that combines indigenous Aztec ritual with Catholicism, brought to the region by Spanish conquistadors. Uh, assured that the dead would be insulted by mourning or sadness, Dia de los Muertos celebrates the lives of the deceased with food, drink, parties, and activities the dead enjoyed in life. 
Dia de los Muertos recognizes death as a natural part of the human experience, a continuum with birth, childhood, and growing up to becoming a contributing member of the community. Jesus, they're, they're going to say this a lot. Dia de los Muertos. <laughs> you don't have to say that over really and over exercising again. exercising my long since dormant white girl mm-hmm. tongue. The death is also <laughs> part of the community, awakened from their eternal sleep to share celebrations with their loved ones. The most familiar symbol of Dia de los Muertos may be the calicas, the calaveras, skeletons, and skulls, which appear everywhere during the holiday in candied sweets. Oh, the sugar skulls, yes, as yeah. masks, as dolls. The skeletons and skulls are almost always portrayed as enjoying life. They're beautiful, too. Often mm-hmm. in fancy clothes and entertaining situations. I was a uh, sugar coal, sugar skull for Halloween a couple of years ago, and I got to tell you, if anybody ever wants to do that, you can get these, um, I, like, they basically are temporary tattoos um, off of Amazon, and you can decor- decorate your face. Nice. With them and instead of yeah, so I just bought black paint and covered my you know colored my eyes bought my eye bone inside and then decorated the rest of my face and it looked so freaking awesome and I put my hair a bun and put like flowers uh, in there and then wore all black and with skeleton leggings and it was like 20 bucks for the whole thing and I was like I went to a bar where they were having a Halloween party and people were like oh my god they were taking pictures with me they loved it right. <laughs> so That's cool. cheap and fantastic Halloween Halloween costume idea so nice Anyway, and everybody that's listening to this, it's October 30th, so you have Amazon Prime. Better order that bad boy now. But mm-hmm. um, anyway, which again, I got to say, I've had two people to reach out to me on Twitter, and they said, I've been listening to your show. You told me to say hi. So I, it makes my black, cold heart just have a little bit of warmth in it every time somebody <laughs> does that. So please come say hi to us on Twitter, because I love it. It makes me happy, because I like our numbers are crazy right now, and I'm like, who are all of you people? <laughs> say hi to who us. Who are you? Engage with us. Yeah, yeah I want to know who you are. Why are you doing that? Um, and I just sent right, you a message, so, girl, so I'll be right back. I see it. It's fine. Um, so now we're moving on to the top 10 most horrific crimes committed on Halloween. Um, yeah, I wanted to do this because I get, I don't think everybody, I mean, I don't think these are really associated with Halloween, but they happened on Halloween and there's quite a few fucked up ones. Uh, so I figured why not? I'm going to read the first one. Uh, number 10 is the trick or treat murder. They had planned the murder for months as the vague wish turned into a solid, horrible truth. They played out each variation in the script again and again until every detail was polished and perfect. They thought of everything. One was the brains behind the killing and the other was the willing, gullible stooge. Neither could have done it alone, but the odd chemistry formed a murderous bond between the two women. I think I know what that bond was, but since this was a while back, they weren't really recognizing it back then. Uh, The first step took more than a month as Joan laid the groundwork for the killing, continually telling Golding that the victim deserved to die. She painted him as a vile, evil man who wanted to destroy all people around him. Although I had never seen him, I built up an intense hatred for him, Golden said. Next, they had to choose a method. They decided they couldn't use poison or a knife. They needed a gun. With a male friend, Golden went to a Pasadena gun shop to select a 38 Smith & Wesson for home protection, quote unquote. Three days later, Joan took her to the store and gave her the money to buy the revolver and two bullets. Now they sat outside the house on Community Street in the car Joan had borrowed from a friend, carefully rehearsing the final details as they waited for the victim to turn on the lights. Golden was wearing a costume Joan had selected for her. Blue jeans, a khaki jacket, red gloves, and makeup. She had the gun and a paper bag as if she was trick-or-treating. About 11.30 p.m., the bedroom lights went out. With Joan's help, Golden put on the Halloween mask, then she walked to the door and rang the bell. The man, yeah, the man who had been turned into a symbol of evil answered the door. It took both hands, but Golden raised the gun, which was still in the bag, pulled the trigger, shooting him in the chest. He died soon after. She ran to the car, and Joan drove back to return it to her friend, Margaret. They left the jacket in the car, but burned the rest of the costume. 
Jones' parting words to Golden were, forget you ever knew me. Uh Uh-oh, Golden got the shaft, but not in the male terms, in the female (laughs) terms. Because that's what she was wanting was the female shaft. Uh, (laughs) This was the closet lesbian murder. Um, Golden kept the revolver, so she checked it in a pay locker at a downtown department store. The perfect plan unraveled in less than two weeks as detectives arrested Joan, 40 years old, in the trick-or-treat murder of hairdresser Peter Fabriano, who operated two salons in the San Fernando Valley. Questioning of Fabriano's wife, Betty, revealed they had recently reconciled after separating over her relationship with Joan, (laughs) a former salon employee who worked as a freelance photographer. Joan was released after being questioned, then arrested when detectives traced the murder weapon to hospital clerk Golden Pizer and found the revolver in a pay locker. Further investigation showed that Joan had brought Golden to one of the salons several times so that she could recognize Peter Fabriano. Nice. So, yeah, and it's funny because I read the original um, article about this and... It was very PC. Like back then, they did not, um, they did not recognize lesbianism back in like the fifties. No. So, yeah, this was a. They were just friends. And why we resort <laughs> I was like, to yeah, murder okay. to get it together. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, interesting. So this one scares me: the pixie stick murder because it involves kids. And as much as I bitch about my kids, uh, mess with them and see what happens to you. So, this is the pixie stick murder. Father is charged in Halloween death. On Halloween night, 1974, Timothy O'Brien went trick-or-treating with his dad and friends in Deer Park, Texas. They approached a house with the lights turned off, but decided to knock anyway. Nobody came to the door, and everyone in the group, except Timothy's dad, moved on to the next house. He quickly caught up with the group. He was holding a handful of pixie sticks, claiming that they had come from the previous home. He passed some around to the children, including two of his own kids. Timothy wanted a little snack that night from his stash of candy, and his dad, Ronald Clark O'Brien, told Timothy that he could have the pixie sticks. The boy ate a few and died just an hour later. The police determined that the pixie sticks were partially filled with cyanide. Luckily, the other kids had not eaten theirs yet. Yeah, just smell the rat already? Uh, it's fucked up, man. Yeah. Ronald told authorities that the poison candy came from the dark house that night, but the man living there had an alibi that checked out. Oops. Uh, he had not been home that night. Police started to look towards Ronald for the murder, especially after realizing that he had taken out life insurance policies on his children. He owed de- debts over $100,000 and was hoping that the insurance money to take care of them. Ronald maintained his innocence, but a jury took less than an hour to convict the motherfucker of murdering his own kid. Mm -hmm. He was executed 10 years after his son's death. Oh, did they give him some poison and let him get sick? And, you know, even an execution is too nice for that guy, but whatever. That's fucked up. Um, This is an interesting one because there's been so many new uh, revelations about it. And there's actually his family still trying to prove his innocence po- after death because he's he was uh executed but this is about sister tadia benz um the lifeless naked body of sister tadia benz was found on halloween night in the convent where she lived she was discovered after her fellow nuns noticed that a window was broken they immediately called the police benz's clothing together with a knife was found under her bed the autopsy on her body revealed that she had been stabbed strangled and raped Mm. johnny frank garrett who lived across the street from the convent was soon arrested by police an eyewitness had seen him running out of the convent the same evening of the murder he was convicted and sentenced to death in 1992 after claiming claiming innocence for 11 years so he died yeah in 1992 okay many believe other Many believe another man, Leonosio Perez Riuda, to be the real perpetrator. DNA evidence linked him to the crime many years later in 2004. After, th- after 30 years of torment, his sisters Gianna Weaver and Janet Dobbins say they are hoping to clear Johnny's name. So they are, and they still are to this day. Like they are trying to uh, prove his innocence, which really would suck if he died. But he apparently he was very schizophrenic and they're saying that they don't 
they think that he was there, but they don't think that he murdered the lady, especially since they found the other guy's DNA on her. So anyway, I'm going to flip this knows? story and say, what if the nun was, you know, having like a threesome with both of those guys? <laughs> Ew. <laughs> you see their picture? And things just kind of got out. She wasn't right, but things just kind of got out of control and stuff happens. That's all sad, but I'm just saying like put another spin on it, kind of like Joan and Betty up here, uh, and you got a whole different mm-hmm. story to tell. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, looking at Sister Tadia, God rest her soul, I don't think she's into dudes, but <laughs> that could just be me. Dudes that aren't God. But anyways, yeah. Uh, so exactly. I have the Jersey Shore Thrill Killer. When Marie- so really quick, mm-hmm. I have these numbered um, as a countdown, mm-hmm. but I literally could not. Number one is for sure the absolute worst story, but the rest of them are kind of all, to, they're all could be interchanged. I don't have necessarily, these aren't going down as the absolute worst one after the other, but number one is definitely the worst. So just FYI, everybody. Okay, yeah, I skipped <laughs> saying seven because I wasn't sure if these no, were in good. order. I mean, how can you rank how terrible these crimes are? Yeah, but yeah, yeah, there's no ranking them, yeah. <laughs> when Maria, see, uh, see, yep, when Maria, 17, yeah. left her New Jersey home to go trick-or-treating in 1981, she was 17, okay, she told her mm-hmm. father she'd be back by midnight. Put on a slutty costume and go to a party like all other 17-year-olds and you'd still be alive. Anyway, a police officer saw her soon after her 12 a.m. walking toward her home and told himself to remember to give her a ride on his way back, but he'd never get that chance. Maria disappeared for more than an hour and a half, only to be found in a ser- serial killer's backyard, her body cut in three pieces. Jesus, he had her for an hour and a half? What an industrious person. The killer, mm-hmm. 42-year-old Richard Bang. Bangenwald had four other victims, one of whom shared Maria's shallow grave behind his mother's Staten Island home. Oh, so it was his mommy's house. He's like psycho. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Bangenwald had a long history of vi- in, of violence. Beaten as a child, he'd tried to set fire to his family home at the age of five. He tried to set himself on fire at 11. Jesus. But as he should that, have succeeded. Yeah, right? That would have saved everyone some trouble. Mm-hmm. As he got older, he turned his hatred on others. He earned the nickname the Jersey Shore Thrill Killer and was sentenced to death in 1983 after the murders of Anna, Betsy, and Maria, and Debbie, and William. Jesus. Uh, so that's what? One, two, three, four, five people that they could actually pin the murders uh, on. A 1984 appeal earned him a life sentence, and he died in prison of natural causes. Too good for this guy at two, in 2008. Mm-hmm. Totally. Um, oh, this one's really sad. Uh, number six, the drive-by murder on Halloween night in, in 1994. Seven-year-old Tony Bagley was trick-or-treating with his family. Dressed in a skeleton costume, Tony was walking ahead of his sister, aunt, and mother when he approached the street corner near the next house. At the same time, a man wearing a hooded sweatsuit ran into the street and started shooting the Bagley family. The hooded man then jumped into a car waiting for him and took off. The Tony's sister, aunt, and mother were all sprayed with gunfire and lived, but Tony did not. The second grader was shot in the head and later died at the hospital. There were no leads on the man who committed this murder, but police chased a theory that it was a family member who was not present that night. Police could never prove that a family member was behind the shooting, and the case is still unsolved. So this next one I want you to read as a bonus. And this did not happen on Halloween, but it happened close to Halloween. And it's called Death by Chocolate, and lots of people eat chocolate on Halloween, so I couldn't resist adding it. (laughs) Uh, This is the way I would want to go. So here's your boner Death by Chocolate story. Yeah. Svetlana Rosalina, 24, is believed to have dropped her cell phone in a huge mixer. See, this is what Yardley was saying last week for the Halloween episode. Your teenager's phone gets thrown into um, into some dressing, and you're going to fish it out. You're not going to leave without your phone. (laughs) So here she goes. She's 24. She's right in that range which isn't too far from Moscow. So she was at a confectionery factory. Her phone dropped into the mixer. Uh, This is in Russia. The mother of two, oh, how sad, was unable to free herself from the chocolate and was therefore minced to death, according to local sources. The Telegraph quotes a source within the factory as saying she was minced and only her legs were left. 
Another person claims Rosalina fell as she was pouring a bag of flour into the mix. The police investigated her death, but no one was arrested in connection to the incident. Although I do have to say, like just being Halloween and talking about spooky things and haunted things, how fucking mm-hmm. haunted is this confectory fa- right? confectionery factor? Factory, Jesus Christ, <laughs> in Moscow, where you probably have a woman with like just no legs like floating around, or maybe you just mm-hmm. have a pair of legs floating around. Like that part's kind of fun to think about. I also hope that none of that fucking chocolate comes over to America because I just <laughs> do not want right to eat. Price, so, and it's Russia. <laughs> yeah. We're down with Russia, True. So. I mean, I guess so. So we probably eating minced up people chocolate right now and going, mm, mm, mm. So, all right, number five is the Necro Preacher. On Halloween night in 2012, John D. White, who is a preacher, entered, entered Rebecca Gay's mobile home and murdered her. White struck her in the head with a mallet several times before tightening a large zip tie around her neck. He had planned on having sex with the corpse after watching several necrophilia pornography videos online, but he was unable to do so because he was too drunk. Gay's three-year-old son was home at the time of the murder, and White stayed with the boy afterward. He dressed the kid in his Halloween costume and delivered him to his father. White confessed to police about the murder and was arrested. Later, White accepted a plea deal for the second-degree murder and was sentenced to 56 years and three months in prison. He committed suicide in prison just months after being convicted. The prison staff tried to revive him after he was found hanging in his cell, but they were unable to do so. Well, good. (laughs) This guy just ran the gambit of, like... (laughs) <laughs> things so that he could up. do that were against, you know, being a priest. He's just like, I'm going to commit suicide. I'm going to rape a corpse. I'm going to murder someone. Like, yeah. oh, my God, dude. Like, yeah, whatever. And the fact that he takes the kid to meet his dad, like, <laughs> what? <laughs> well, he so tried to do up. one thing. <laughs> yeah. He tried. I guess. Bless his soul, Here, Jesus, not- I'm good now, right? <laughs> All right, so number four, the murders of Leslie Mazzara and Adrian Insognia. Let's just go with Leslie and Adrian. Yeah. Late on Halloween night in 2004, roommates Leslie and Adrian and Lauren went to bed after handing out candy. Uh, Leslie was woken up at 1 a.m. by the sounds of a scuffle. Not knowing what was happening, she ran in terror from the house and hid in the backyard. Hey, at least she didn't try to go investigate like every goddamn horror yeah. movie chick. Watching the exactly. assailant climb out of the window. Yes, run away. Good. When the coast was clear, she ran back upstairs and found both of her roommates dead. Yeah, but you're alive because you're smart, so I'm happy that you yeah. did that. Throughout the investigation, FBI agents found cigarette butts near the scene of the crime that matched blood evidence inside the house, but found no known matches in any DNA database. Officers and FBI agents spoke to nearly 1,500 persons of interest during the investigation of the double murder, including one of uh, Adrian's friends, Lily Prudhorn. Her husband, Eric Koppel, became a person of extreme interest during the investigation when he refused to give a DNA sample to exclude him from the suspect pool. That's always sketch. Nearly a year after the crime, Koppel turned himself in and confessed to the deaths of his wife's friends while giving no motives for his crimes. At the time of the murders, Koppel was only engaged to the friend of one of his victims and carried on with the wedding, thinking the crimes would not be tied to him. A quote from Adrian's mother, uh, Arlene, gives a chilling insight into the murder who, murderer who thought he got away with it. You are the man who is so cruel as to invite me, the mother of the woman you murdered, to stand up for you at your wedding, to read a scripture to you of love and death and bless your union. Throughout that weekend, you brought me into the heart of your family, knowing all the while it was you who destroyed mine. That's fucked up. Ah. Nice guy. (laughs) Yeah. Uh... 2000, mine is number three, uh, the Woodbridge abductions. In 2009, three teenage girls were abducted by a man with a gun on their way home from trick-or-treating in Woodbridge, Virginia. All three were taken at gunpoint to a wooded area and two were sexually assaulted. The third girl was able to call her mother, causing the man to flee. Two years later, police arrested Aaron Thomas, who was already a suspect in numerous sexual assault cases since 1997. Wow. Thomas pleaded guilty in 2012 to the three kidnappings. He looks like a creepy-ass dude. Yeah. Too. 
So, excuse me, the son of Sam, Sam Killings, I've always actually thought about doing something on this for the podcast. They're very interesting, so I'm happy to get to read this one. Sometime in the early hours of Halloween 1981, Manhattan couple Ronald Sisman and Elizabeth Platzman were murdered in their Chelsea apartment. The couple was severely beaten after being shot after before being shot in the head execution style with the apartment being completely ransacked. New York police initially believed drug money to be the motive, but then the case took a turn for the bizarre. A prison informant claimed to be one of his fellow one of, that, that one of his fellow inmates had predicted the crime weeks before it actually happened. That inmate turned out to be the son of sand killer David Berkowitz. Berkowitz had long been rumored to be involved with a satanic cult that helped him with some of the murders. According to the informant, Berkowitz had told him that his cult was planning to enter a residence near Greenwich Village, Chelsea would qualify for that, on Halloween to carry out a ritual murder. When questioned, Berkowitz claimed that Sisman had footage of one of the Son of Sam shootings and was planning to hand it over to authorities in exchange for dropping some drug charges. While no evidence was found to support Berkowitz's claims, he was basically right about the description of the Sisman's apartment, and the killings are still unsolved. Isn't that crazy? So he could, like, committed murder unofficially, they think, but there's just not enough proof, yeah. in, while he was in prison. Like, he directed these people to go kill um, and do a ritual for how on Halloween. Wow. That's fucked up, man. It is. This, okay, so this is hands down number one. I had never heard of this and was just blown blown away. I hate to say that. Really was blown away reading the story. Um, in 1963, the Indiana Explosion. And I included a wonderful picture of dead bodies laying Yay, on the ice. Yay, so. it's Halloween, all right. Um, <laughs> On Halloween night, 1963, during a holiday on ice skating exhibition in the Indiana State Fairgrounds Coliseum, which I've been to, had no idea of this history, a propane gas explosion killed 74 people and injured nearly 400. 74 fucking people. It was just after 11 p.m. and the skaters were finished, were finishing a medley called Mardi Gras. No one realized that propane gas was leaking from a rusty Jesus. tank in the concession area, slowly filling the unventilated room. Oh. Never put a fucking propane gas tank in a tent, people! Yeah, well. Anyway, <laughs> as the skaters began gliding into a pinwheel formation for the finale, the gas came oh into God. contact with an electric popcorn machine. When the gas ignited, a blast of orange flame shot 400 feet up through the south side seats catapulting people and chairs through the air. Concrete chunks and bloody parts rained down. 54 people were killed on the scene, another 20 died later of their injuries. Rescuers used the nearby cattle barn as a temporary hospital, and the coroner's office set up a temporary morgue on the ice floor. Wow. The dead were placed on plywood and lined up on the ice according to gender and age. Family members who came to identify loved ones had to register at the intimate administration building before being led to the Coliseum. Wow. So, yeah, that's some fucked up shit that's right some there. fucked up shit, and that's a lot of ghouls to haunt a place, too. They say sometimes, um, that's what they say about the Queen Mary. There was that uh, time when they hit another ship that I can't remember off the top of my head right now, but the people on both sides weren't expecting it, you know, because the Queen Mary was so mm -hmm. large it never saw it, and basically it killed about that, I want to say more people than that, but it, the point is, that they, paranormal investigators will tell you when people die unexpectedly, like a large number of people die when they weren't expecting to, that you can really get some crazy hauntings like forever in that place just from the energy yeah. of the confusion of all those souls just being alive one minute watching a finale and being, you know, dead the next minute having had their own finale. So kind of interesting. Yep, I was just reading real quick while you were talking. Um, it was on a standards exec course. Uh, it was the HMS Kura, Kuraka, yeah. Kuriako, um, in 19, it was 1942, is that what it was? Yeah, it was yeah. during the wartime, and the Queen Mary was supposed to kind of escort the ship, but because the little boat was on a zigzag pattern, I've, I've been on the Queen Mary and gotten to kind of hear about all of this, but the Queen Mary actually, it was kind of like when trains hit cars nowadays, like, mm -hmm. they don't even, I mean, they know only because they saw the car, but as far as feeling it, the boat just kept going, the Queen Mary kept going, and the other boat was ripped in half, and everybody died pretty instantly, it was pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it said, 
It said the Queen Mary sliced the cruiser in two like a piece of butter, yeah. straight through the six inch armored plating. The Queen Mary just carried on going. It was policy not to stop and pick up survivors, even if they were waving at you. It was too dangerous. In more time, you would have gotten shot down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. That's crazy. Yeah, it is. And wow. so they, they say never that that area that. of the Queen Mary where it struck is very, supposedly, I never experienced anything there, even though I've been there a couple times, um, but it's supposedly very haunted just due to the extreme shock that, you know, the people would have been in when they had that impact occur. Wow. This, I just saw somebody's comment. This is crazy. He says, my father, James Rand, was the ship's electrical officer. After two years of service aboard her, he left for another posting the day before the tragedy. Holy shit. This was, 20, this was 22 days before I was born. Given his station on the ship, he was certain that he too would have perished. My fr- father wrote an account of life on HMS Kira, Kirakoa. How do you say that? In the cruiser experience that was produced by my uncle, Eric C.B. Lee. I have some memorabilia of the ship. Wow. Wow. He's from Australia. That's insane. That would be an interesting I've show topic someday to do. Kind of like yeah. 9-11 where people talk about I was supposed to be on this flight or, you know, and I avoided yeah. it or all these things. To do kind of the near-death experiences where people were supposed to be somewhere and weren't at the last minute. Yeah. Like that cool. that would be a great one. Yeah. Hey, sign it up, girl. <laughs> well, it is my show in two weeks, and I haven't decided what I'm doing, yep. so there you go. Um, yep. Next month, next month, Jesus Christ, next week, <laughs> actually it will be next month, though it'll be November, he hardly yeah. wants to do a Netflix original movie called Araman Terry, sure, the, we'll go with that, The Blacksmith yep. and the Devil, and I looked it up on Netflix last night, and I'm sure he would have more information, but I'll give you what I know. It's a weird looking movie. It's an hour and 40 minutes long and it's basically a blacksmith and it's back in the days. I'm not sure exactly when, um, who has captured a demon. I think the demon was responsible for the death of one of his loved ones, maybe. And he's been tormenting. So it's a kind of a twist on the thing. He's been torturing this demon, um, for the demon's crimes. But at some point, a desperate child that is not his child comes to him and accidentally lets the demon out uh, so yeah, you have high stakes whenever you have demons and small children involved. So it should be an interesting movie. It's something definitely different for all of us. Um, and again, Aram and Terry, the blacksmith and the devil, it's a Netflix original. So it's available. It's new to watch now. If y'all want to watch along with us in advance of, uh, us spoiling it next week. And Christy, do you want to tell us what's going on on Patreon? Yep. Uh, so I wanted to give a little bit of a shout out to Moni for doing some really kick-ass reviews on Patreon, movie reviews. And um, also, I posted a uh, hauntings around Roswell, Georgia, where I live, um, a very uh, really hotbed from the Civil War and very uh, notoriously haunted. I'm going to do another chapter hopefully this next week. Um, And then also, I changed our tiers um, we are going to start doing Drunk Horror Story. We had some serious technical difficulties this week. It's been hell, yeah. but I think I got them worked through. Uh, so we didn't get to it this week, but I took off our last tier and, um, changed Drunk Horror Story to the third tier. So it's a pretty damn good deal that you would get for 10 bucks a month. Um, you would get movie reviews, videos, all our haunting stuff, all our haunted library, everything, and Drunk Horror Story for 10 bucks a month. You're practically getting, like, all everything and all we have and all we own and all we love for 10 bucks a month. So if that's something that appeals to you, definitely get on there and check it out. Uh, we're still trying to learn all about Patreon and navigate it, so it's slow going, and we appreciate everybody's patience. I owe uh, a ton of movie reviews. I watched a shit ton of TV shows and horror from Netflix and Shudder and regular TV this last week, so I'm going to throw it down. I also reached out, fingers crossed, to the director and writer of an amazing movie on Shudder called Summer of 84. Have you seen it? I've been wanting to watch it. Yes. Is that good? It's so good. It's really good. It's a really uh, crazy Stranger Things. It's about kids, but it's really good. The ending was just will blow your wig back, and (laughs) I loved it. So I decided to maybe, because he's, you know, this is his first movie, and I thought maybe Shot in the Dark 
uh, I could get him to come on. It, it would be awesome if we could do a movie review and talk to him at the same time. Awesome. So, or maybe I can just do like a written interview and ask him some questions, but we'll see. I'll take what I can get. But anyway, um, he liked one of my posts on Twitter. So that's how I found out he exists. And I'm like, holy shit, he liked my post about his show. So I went out and was like went on a limb and said hey we want to talk That'd to you be awesome so, yeah anyway um, fingers crossed that'll happen i owe our patreon listeners another i do it every week so it's another video and i may or may not show my boobs i don't know it's becoming a thing <laughs> but <laughs> i will do a what's great what's good and what's meh in the week in horror in my experience i am currently reading a black dahlia graphic novel um, so I talk about some, some books that I'm reading too, in case you want to get spooky that way. I watched a Hulu original called the body. So there's a few things that I'll be able to speak to. I haven't been as active this week as usual. Uh, there was one more thing. Oh guys, the library. I do. I do. I owe Patreon subscribers. I am in now in possession of all of the, um, EVPs that were captured the night of our nice. crazy night in the library. And some of them are what's called class A. They are super clear. So I will tease a little on our Facebook page. You'll get to hear one or two, but I have 60 freaking EVPs. And oh my gosh. I would say 90%, maybe 95% wow. are answering specific things that me or the investigators are actually talking about. So that's awesome. Some of them I can't were heard that day when we were actually there. Some of them we didn't catch until the recording, but they are still answering what we're saying. There is one entity that we were referring to. He's probably named Virgil because that's what he said. Um, he is the mansplainer Aww. because we talk the dress. Yeah, yeah. What's, what's I have that's so funny. I have a friend, an older friend. He was like a dad to me growing up who passed from cancer last Aww. year. So. Hearing the name Virgil brinks my heart happy. I can't wait to hear what he has yeah, to say. Yeah, he was a mansplainer, nice. so he may or may not fantastic. be. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. He may or may not be responsible for the footprint on, in my office that won't go away because he said that he he laughed about that, um, <laughs> and he actually was the. I think he was the mansplainer. Basically, whenever someone would ask a question, they wouldn't even get to the end of their sentence, and he'd be yelling out the answers. So <laughs> we thought that was That's kind of funny. funny. That even in death, wow. men still kind of talk over women. So that was kind of funny. Yep. Um, to yep. This past Saturday. So yesterday, God, my life is long. No, Friday. I was getting prepared for a big presentation that I was doing in our community for the library. And so I was in the building, the library building at like seven in the morning, running to grab like a laptop and a flash drive and all these things. And I was the only one in there because I had undone the alarm, nobody else. And I go running past the doorway where I've seen it before. But and we we did um, talk about this before that there is a about six foot tall black silhouette figure that multiple, multiple people have seen in the library. And as I'm literally running back and forth to make it to this presentation on time, I see it out of the corner of my eye in the same place that I've seen it before. And I wanted so bad, first of all, to not be in such a hurry because I was legit needing to get moving. But second of all, not mm -hmm. be such a wuss because he's never hurt anybody. <laughs> Nothing in our library's ever hurt anyone. I wanted to stop and look. And I thought about it for a split second, but I ended up nervously giggling and just and literally saying out loud, not today, and just kept running through mm -hmm. the library to get out of there because You're like la 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 I can't really hear you. Be, la la I didn't really want to be in there alone with him. On the other hand, I should have turned mm -hmm. and looked fully and seen what if he would disappear. If he would try to say something, but I chickened out. Um, I'm curious, listeners, if you're thinking right now that you would have also chickened out in that situation or if you would have faced it. I feel like every horror movie ever, though, happens when the girl alone faces whatever is looking at her. Yeah. Don't ever stop and look. Just keep going. So anyway, that's, yeah. that's my creepy story for the week. That's awesome. Um, also, I got to tell you, so I had a friend come down and visit me from uh, Wisconsin this last week. And when she comes down, it's insanity. Uh, I had to take some days off work and we, I showed her around. We hit a ton of cool hot spots. And I took her to dinner up north, a little bit north of me to this old, it's in an old house. And I was, you know, sitting there, we were eating and I asked him, hey, have you guys ever had any weird experiences here? And she's like, oh, you mean like Steve? And I'm like, yeah. I guess Steve, sure. And she's like, yeah, Steve lives in the closet upstairs. Oh my God. Steve doesn't, and it's our, she's like, and it's our like organ, like our closet where we keep all our supplies, like our napkins and our everything. She's like, and he won't let us in. Like sometimes it's like a rush and we're trying to get in there and he won't let us in the supply closet. So she's like, we go in there and we, 
we like walk in the supply closet and the door slams and then you can't get out. Oh my God. And lots of people have seen him too. So I was like, dude, I want to come talk to y'all. Yeah. So then she's like, well, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, you need to go up to Canton. There's apparently a church up there called Hell's Church. Oh. And the whole entire ground, grounds of that church are horribly haunted. And I looked it up and oh yeah, it's like all over the internet. So I'm like, dude, I got to go up there. And another thing I'm going to, I'm trying to do is apparently the house that was the film on the, the series, The Haunting of Hill House. Yeah. Is only 45 minutes away. Oh, nice. And um, so I want to go visit them, too. So we have a ton of cool video shit that's about to drop on Patreon. So that is all going to be, I mean, we'll talk about it on the show, but to actually see it, you have to get on there. And um, it'll be worth, it'll definitely be worth the uh, investment. Um, also, me and Moni will be meeting up in San Jose. We're like a week and a half out from that. That's yeah, crazy. yeah, we're, we're like really close, and I can't wait. Uh, we'll be staying in a haunted hotel and then going to the Winchester and Lord knows what other shenanigans we're going to get ourselves into. So that there'll be a lot of video of that. Um, also, I'm finally getting my shit together and doing a ton of stuff on my Instagram, uh, which will also, of course, play over on Twitter, too. But uh, I've learned now, like I have been such an old lady about it, about my Instagram stories and everything. So I'm finally learning how to do that. And uh, got that all set up, and I'm doing a ton of posts, and I have literally a creep in it uh, uh, icon dedicated to any shenanigans and fun stuff I see around town or talking about the show. Nice. So come find me, Creepin' Christy, uh, spelled K-R-I-S-T-I, uh, Creepin' spelled with a C. And um, you can also find me at Creepin' underscore it on Twitter or just search the Creepin' It Real show. So where can we find you, Miss Moni? I am Rebel Moni on Twitter, and I am Moni Bear on Instagram, and that's where I'm much more active. And also our um, our show Facebook page, Yardley and I especially, but Christy too, but everybody, we, uh, we really interact with fans there, so find us there as well. Yep. All right. Well, with that... Thank you, Miss Moni, for being my partner in crime this evening. Thank Yardley, you for being the backbone had... of this whole thing. Y'all don't know. <laughs> like, the podcast gods have not been kind, and Christy has kept us going. No. So. Uh, Yardley, I hope you had great at Voodoo Fest, you motherfucker. I've always wanted to go to Voodoo Fest. He goes every goddamn year. You better be so ready to report on it next, next Yeah. Oh, you know, I bet it has an awesome lineup, so I'm sure he's having a ball. Uh, so, anyway, everybody, good luck to you. Happy Halloween, and creep it real.